So welcome back, episode 29 of Pals Pod. Phil, how are you today? Very well, mate. How are you? Yeah, good. Friday, kind of three o'clock, winding down for the week. Weekends here. And some uh, some rugby to watch. Yeah, yeah. So we've got uh, England, uh, hopefully, getting back on track tomorrow, I'm guessing, against oh, Italy. God. Imagine if we don't. <laughs> I tell you what, if we if we do lose, I bet the uh, the talk of relegation from the Six Nations disappears quite quick, very quickly, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then Scotland Wales in the afternoon or late afternoon, and uh, Ireland France on Sunday. So good weekend of rugby, um, some good games in there. Uh, it's also my birthday tomorrow, so I'll definitely be allowed, definitely be allowed to watch the rugby tomorrow. Is that? Uh, I think you're allowed to watch as much rugby as you wish. Well, I'm allowed to have a TV remote for the first time in about four years tomorrow, I think. <laughs> much deserved, much deserved. Um, so, shall we quickly dwell on last week's poor performance from England? I mean, yeah, we were, we were on it last week, weren't we? We were, we were live on the gram. <laughs> um, probably too, too often for a lot of people's liking. Um <laughs> It wasn't a good game, was it? Um, even, you know, Scottish supporters would probably be disappointed at the standard of the game. But Scotland did enough to beat a very unorganised England team, I think, is the is the overview. And and there wasn't much to, to write home about. No, for me, it was uh, the, the little time we had the ball, we didn't use it correctly in any way. But I think, obviously, tomorrow he's gone back to Ford Fowl Slade. And I mean, it's Italy. We should be shifting half a century on Italy, but I think that's probably going to stay um, Ford Fowl Slade now for the rest of the tournament, I imagine. Ollie Lawrence didn't really give anything, did he? I, I don't think he, he... I don't think he showed what he can do. I don't think he was allowed to show what he can do, but he also just didn't look up to scratch defensively. No. So, you know... He, <sighs> It's it's tough because he he might now not you know there's other players in the past that's happened to where they've had their debut everyone's buzzing about them and then they have a bit of a slow start and and you don't see him again for three years yeah um, yeah in an England jersey so you know Matthew Tate probably being one of those and, and a few others um, so yeah it's a shame but you know <laughs> they're meant to be the best players in the country and last week they were. Probably outshone, yeah, quite badly by by Scotland, who are not deemed to be of higher as higher quality. No, definitely. I mean, some big names were off, weren't they? Like Billy Vanapola wasn't great. Jamie George wasn't great. Farrell wasn't the committed that he normally seems to be. And I think, I think, obviously, they'll all openly admit that they were a bit crap. But yeah, it was a shame. I'm surprised that uh, some of the selections again this week. I mean. He's changed it up a bit, but it would have been a good time to see some of the younger lads bench at least, and that's not happening. So, obviously, they're, they're just uh, going to try and cap him for 20 minutes on the last game of the Six Nations so they can't go and play for uh, <laughs> any of the other home nations. Well, I think also that, you know, they, they've delved into this idea of the Saris lads will be fine, you know, they've trained, they've kept themselves fit. I think this is a good opportunity as any against Italy to, you know, keep that fitness going. Obviously, Jamie George has been on, put on the bench, I think. Yeah. Right. So he, he obviously has impressed so poorly that he's been dropped to the bench, but the other series lads just need the game time. You know, you can train as much as you like. It's the old adage that, you know, train hard, play easy. It's just not the case. You, know, you need to be playing regularly to, just to get into the game and get used to the, the flow of game. So we'll see. It'll be, uh, well, for me, it'll be highly entertaining if Italy win um, because I'm an Italy fan. But um, <laughs> that's not been so easy to watch either over the last few years. But yeah, we'll see. I mean, the other games, you know, the Scotland-Wales game could be interesting because, you know, if Scotland go down to 14 men, it might be a game because Wales don't seem to be able to play against 14 as well as they can play against 15. No. no. <laughs> this is true. And I mean... Annoyingly, the Scots actually look like they could carve most teams up at the minute. I know defensively we weren't on point last week, yeah, whatever. I mean, we conceded one, should have conceded more, but I mean, if 
Finn and Cameron Path just play like they did on Saturday, they're probably not going to, the Welsh probably aren't going to stop them very easy getting points on the board. No, but I can't remember who I was talking to last week. But I thought George North looked really good at 13, mm. um, which is, you know, is, is positive for Wales. Um, yeah. and, and, and Wales were actually, before, before the red card, were on top uh, and looking quite good. The the red card kind of confused the game for everyone, I think, because the Irish were like, oh, God, now we're going to get hammered. And the Welsh, for some reason, felt the same. Yeah. So um, it would be interesting to see that game. I think that could be quite a close one, personally. I think that might be quite a good game Saturday yeah. afternoon. The Irish just did that thing of, right, we need to uh, just keep the ball moving now. Don't let him set. And it worked for him, didn't it, for the majority? And also, I thought defensively, Ireland were absolutely awesome. Mm. You know, you one man down, and and you know, having been in that position a couple of times myself, you, it almost galvanizes anyone, everyone. It makes them realize they've got to do that little bit of extra work. When you know, if, if sometimes you feel like if your team could do that when they've got fifty men on the field, they'd be world beaters. But for some reason, having one less man seems to really help a lot of teams out. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and final game of the weekend, Ireland and the French. I mean, I can only see France winning that. There's, I can only see France winning the tournament now. Um, I know that they're only playing Italy, but I don't feel like they got out of second gear. And that um, du, du, Dupont, Dupont nine, yeah, he is just different gravy. He is, He's, yeah. There's a lot of talk about him being the best nine in the world at the minute. Which, well, is... Aaron Smith, the Kiwi scrum off, said so. Mm. On, on Twitter or Instagram yesterday and um, you know when you're getting kudos from him as being yeah. the best player in the world then you're probably doing alright but um, yeah. yeah he he was class and I think the French you know they're, they're quite a young team but a really well drilled really well motivated team um, and Galtier I know he gets a lot of crap from from the press about being grumpy and hard to work with well he's Doing French. something right. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he's French. Yeah. Comes with the jeans. I think the only concern the French have is if they don't get out of that gear because Italy were moving through the middle of the park quite nicely at points. So if the French defence can switch on and kind of look like they should have looked, they should look, then I think it'd be a comfortable, comfortable grand slam for them. But I'm not saying that here first. No, I mean, anyway. you're right. The defensively, France looked a bit weak at times but you know me and you we're, we're messaging each other in that first sort of 10 minutes of that game we're oh god it look alright here and they had the ball for the first 6 minutes where it was and France touched it 3 phases and scored from yeah. like their own 10 metre line and you're like oh ok maybe they aren't that strong so maybe the French kind of weren't fully uh, fully focused on what they were doing defensively but uh, yeah it's uh, it could be a good weekend it could be right before we move on to the pod. Um, obviously, are we both? Let's let's do how we think it's going to finish at the end of the tournament, table wise. Table wise, yeah. Obviously, are we are we going to say the, teams are. the Italians being the wooden spoon this year again? I think yeah. I think they've got to be. I think it's at the bottom, so we'll have that. Uh, followed closely by Wales. Yeah. Do you think? Uh, there's a new, there's a coach turnover. Then, if Wales finish there, no, not this, year. Not, not this, this year. year, not this year, next year maybe. Um, Scotland, England will be on the same points, so we'll be just down to points. Then Ireland and then France, I think. So you think it's going to be France, Ireland, Scotland, and England? Interesting. Not sure. I'm. I'm. I'm wondering if it will be France, Scotland, England, Ireland that way. But we'll have to wait and see. The I, I think. I think England will beat Ireland. Yeah. Ireland will beat Scotland. So they might all be on the same points. To be fair. Yeah. But Ireland will have the better points difference. Yeah, I guess it depends how many points we all ship against Italy. <laughs> and Wales. Come down to who can go three figures on Italy and really <laughs> embellish themselves for second place. 
<laughs> this is where we go and put 20 past and smile and then call it a day. <laughs> right. Um, this, this week's pod, Josh Pune, good lad. Yeah. Um, known Josh since he came back to a bit about 15, 16. Um, you'll hear in the podcast about his, uh, his tennis career that sadly never really took off for him. Um, but he, he's just very down to earth lad. You know, he works hard and, and has had a bit of a change in the last 12 months or whatever it's been um, to to his lifestyle at Nottingham. So, really interesting. I thought Josh was very honest and open about everything and we thank him for that. And, and you know, he's, he's quite excited to uh, keep in touch and keep involved with us going forward. Yes. Yeah, no, I think it's uh, it's nice to have a, a, a rugby player in the limelight still as such being brutally honest about the decisions people have made and how that impacts him and his his teammates and his job at the end of the day so yeah no it's good to chat to him we'll have to we're, we're going to get him back on one of the live shows at some point aren't we or probably a few times because he's down the road um sh- should we get into it do it do it done it So here we are with Josh Poulet. Josh, how you doing? Very well, thank you. Yourself? Yeah, good, good. Um, so just normally we just give a little intro to uh, to people. I mean, a lot of people are going to know who you are at Pavs, but you were a, a, a tennis genius, supposedly. I'm sure we'll uh, we'll come back to that at some point. Um, you started playing rugby from an early age. Uh, what age did you start playing? I think it was five or six at Pavs. At Pabs. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, I mean, you don't have to start at Pabs to be on the podcast, but it does help. Uh, <laughs> and, and now you're uh, you're at Nottingham Rugby. Um, but obviously you said you started playing at a young age. Why did you get into rugby? Oh, I can't really remember at that age, but I think it was probably because the old man was keen into it. And I was probably a little bit boisterous for my age. And I think um, yeah, that was about it. And then I enjoyed it all the way through to link, until I stopped to obviously take over the the tennis genius side of things when I was about, I think it was 10, 9 or 10. Should we uh, delve into the tennis genius thing now, Phil? Because you obviously... <laughs> so know so I don't know that much about it, but all I remember is... So I think Josh came back at about 15, 16? Yeah, 16, I think. 16. 16. So Josh would have come straight into a team I was coaching. I was coaching the Colts at Pavias, I think. So Josh came in back then for a season or two and his dad I remember his dad coming over and goes oh yeah he's just started back up he he was going to be a really good tennis player but I can't remember what happened but he decided he didn't want to do it anymore and I was like alright you know I was thinking oh all dads think their son's amazing at tennis and then I can't remember who else told me but someone else thought, oh you know that Josh Poulet he's amazing at tennis <laughs> and he just like and he just stopped and so and then I had um, I got quite a few friends in the tennis arena uh, one of them actually runs the Nottingham Tennis Centre now. So I remember discussing Josh with the guy, and he goes, "Oh yeah, he was class. He was a really good tennis player." So, so why why did you why did you can the tennis in Josh? Well, oh, it was probably about thirteen, fourteen when I just started to probably have like well, what you class as if you can class it at that age, where a breakthrough year, it started doing really well like nationally so in, in England so it's different setups over here like you can do well over here in England I suppose but you're not the better boys are even at that age mum and dad have probably got a bit more money than most so they're off in Europe playing around and you can only really play in Europe when you're younger and then obviously when you go to the men's you're all over the world but I was probably 13, 14 it all kicked off and I was in Europe when I was fifth, well, just going on 14 coming on to 15 and then um, I can't remember where I was but um I just served and landed on my left leg and my whole back gave out. So like, no, not, not a spasm. So I know what, we all know what a spasm is now, but it wasn't like an old man back pain. I just couldn't put any pressure on my left leg. So that went, tried to carry on, didn't work, went to the doctors. Nothing came of one scan. So we just put it down to fatigue apparently. So then I carried on and it happened when I was out. I think it was either in Turkey or Egypt playing a tournament in some Europe stage. And it went again. But this time it was, it took me about 20, 30 minutes just to get back walking again. So it sounded pretty serious. So we were like, right, I think we need a few more scans. <laughs> the e- doctor at Egypt tried to do it and we were like, 
because at this time I was getting a bit of help from the LTA, which is the governing body over there, like the RFU. They were like, no, we're flying back. We'll get it all sorted. So we got it sorted over here. And basically, I think it's like, I can't really remember, but like a CT or an MRI. Like normally when you see a bone crack, your bone's like um, white, isn't it, on the scan? And then the crack will show up as black. So this is quite similar, but it gives you loads of like matter in the background. And it showed you my hip and my back and my whole left side was white, which I thought it was meant to be, and it's not. It means that all my left-hand side of my back was weaker than my right, and apparently it's genetic. So and for it all to be that case, they normally see it in a small bit if you're going to get stress fractures, and it was all over my lower hip and my top of my back. It's called bone marrow edema, apparently. And they said, I'm lucky not to have several stress fractures in my hip and my back. So it basically said at that point, they didn't tell me to my face. I think they told my parents. They didn't tell, tell me that I probably would never, shouldn't play tennis again. So the recommendation to start off with was I couldn't jog for six months. I had to walk to try and um, let it rest and recover. So I had a scan at six months and it was all fine. So we tried to go back and then within three months it had gone back to just how it was. So you thought, oh, that's a shame. I won't play tennis. That, you know, thoroughly dangerous sport. I'll, <laughs> I'll play rugby. I'll play rugby. And... Uh, <laughs> That's, that's the thing, though, because that was a weird thing. Because obviously I thought then, because obviously when you're good at rugby, you, you're just doing it in the evenings, aren't you, when you're a kid? You're probably part of NLD. You're part of, you might be playing a year age group or two. You might only ever get pulled out of school for, let's say, an England camp or a Midlands camp or something like that. Whereas with the tennis, I was home, homeschooled from the minute I finished year seven for the rest of it. Because obviously the LTA paid for it. I was part of an academy you, your friends are the people you're competing against. That's all All I kind of ever knew was the tennis side of it because that's all you were ever going to be. When you were that kind of standard, you invested that much money from your pet. You were getting that much money like kind of funded to you that there was one goal and that's to play tennis. So, yeah, quite strange. But then it happened. And then when I said to the doctor, is anywhere I can play any more sport? Because... I hated school because I'd never been I was like I don't really want to go to college and fucking uni because like, I, can't, I can't fucking stand it because like all my home my schooling was my mum shouting at me telling me I'm not doing it properly so I was like I'm not going to school I'm not doing college which I ended up doing both but he was like yeah you can um, you can do any sport that's not repetitive so I was obviously training five or six hours a day and I was right handed which it won't make, make much sense to you lot but being right handed I'm transferring a lot of weight to my left hand side all the time so landing when I'm serving I don't know, forehand, any like volleys, you're putting most of your weight through your weak side, which was knackering me, obviously, in the, in the long run. Hmm. So just said, you're going to have to can it in. I was like, okay, I used to play rugby. And that's when I got, <laughs> I told friends, it was Ross Martincroft, his, his dad, Carl, he used to be one of the coaches and Alistair's dad, oh, I forgot his name, that's terrible. Um, he, um, they just turned around to me and said, I'll come down for a training session. So I asked the doctor and he was like, yeah, as long as you're not doing rugby for six hours a day, you'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, so, now, so now again, you, you still do rugby now until the beginning of this season, at least you're doing it about six hours a day. <laughs> yeah. So how, how have you managed to not, you know, struggle with what sounds like a, essentially a bone deficiency in rugby? <laughs> Couldn't even, couldn't really tell you because it's always been something that's in the back of my mind. Like, do you know when you get, um, I've had like a back spasm or something in the gym, you kind of think when you're doing like a, you wouldn't know it from looking at my legs, but if you're doing like a leg session, a big leg session. Or something, yeah, it doesn't matter when you're doing 20s though, does it, mate? <laughs> no, <it's not. laughs> but like, do you, mean you, do you pull you back and I'm a bit like, oh shit, is that it? Is it? Is that the thing? It's always in the back of your head, but mate, this, it's like, if it happens, it happens. It's, I don't yeah. think it, I've never had the, because, at that age, I was ignoring all the signs of like fatigue and tightness because you just had it all the time because you were training all the time and you were a young kid. You just got go and roll it out, go in an ice bath for half an hour. That'll sort you out. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't normally work, but sometimes does. But uh, it's not something that, like I said, it's not repetitive. The amount of different things you do in the rugby, you're never ever loading that side all the time, no. and hmm. especially not playing on concrete either. I mean. Some of these 4Gs are probably quite up there, but you're never playing on concrete or a hard court for six hours. So it's completely different. And thankfully for me, something that's never popped up again. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you've... Uh, it's not a bad excuse to, oh, I've got to play rugby now because it's not repetitive. So I'll go back to that. <laughs> um, when you went back to playing rugby, did you have a rugby idol at all? Honestly, not really, because I was, I was obviously so invested with the tennis. It was, it was kind of... I was just, I thought that I'd be good at it. And my friends were, 
still involved in it. Some of the lads that were still playing when I was six, seven. So I was like, I'll just give it another go. Like, not another go, as in just something to just enjoy. Because it was something at that time just to kind of, because you do, even at that age, you kind of get up at the full time, get get like a, have enough of that full time, constant wake up, go to sleep, thinking about tennis. So it was just something to get into. Mm. Something to enjoy. So there was never really any thought of an idol or anything to do with that. It was just get in there, enjoy it. Yeah, fair enough. Phil, you can take the uh, the idol banner if you want, mate. Uh, as, <laughs> That's what I'm playing for Nottingham, mate. You just literally followed in my footsteps. All of you. Back you... row, Nottingham, from Paviers. To yeah. be fair, I was going to drop this later on, but it's actually quite akin now. There's actually a picture of of Josh standing next to Noah um, on Facebook at on the balcony at Pavs and for some reason Facebook has listed you as me so there you go so it's on it's on my profile and it came up a few days ago so it's a couple of years since it was taken or whatever and I was like that's that's not me <laughs> <laughs> that is a lot smaller and trimmer version of me if that is me <laughs> well, I mean well, come on <laughs> a lot of trimmer. I had a lot of trimmer, mate. You don't want to be in this state at the moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's grim. Uh, Josh, have you ever told Neil Bat to fuck off? <laughs> I've told who to fuck off. Neil Bat. Why would I tell him to fuck off? Well, Phil oh, did. You're not um, me. It's fine. You're not me. You're not uh, me. Yeah, if you want to be <laughs> there, you've got to tell him to fuck off. Um, so you came back to Paris. Who were who were you playing with, and what was that like? Um, playing with well, who's it? Molyneux is my age, Matt. Yeah, uh, there's, there's literally I don't think there's anyone else in that team that carried on really it was kind of because you've got to think of that age it's that 16, 17 group as well isn't it so it's like the the age where the uh, the drink starts coming involved and the college starts coming involved isn't it so a lot of lads filter off a lot of lads don't come to train but that, so that was kind of it was kind of an in and out age group I suppose but we were still I think that age group was the I don't know how the, the Colts have been getting on since, but we were very, very successful at that age group. Yeah, but you yeah. guys sort of set up the year after you guys set up for, so you guys did really well and the Colts qualified for the National Cup the year after you, I think. Yeah, I've, well, I think we made... Who did we lose to? I think it was... Did we lose to Bosworth or something in the semis? I don't know if it was... The, it might have been the National Cup or we lost them somewhere in Midlands because we played like Wolverhampton. Yeah, you played in the Midlands one, didn't you? Midlands and then lost yeah, the I think you guys played in the Midlands one and then got so far that put us in the national the next year and we got to the we got to the semi final of the plate in the national one and lost to some uh, Pocklington, it was the year after you. But yeah, it was it, your team was quite good, just a bit of a team of misfits to be fair. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah, it was good. I mean, yeah, obviously Matt's still there, isn't he? But yeah, he's probably the only one that's I think he's probably the only one that's still playing that I know of. Mm. I mean, I think oh, it's, it's bad to say I don't remember some of the names, but I think from coaching Corsairs, I think there's a few lads that play for some of the other, like during the lower down teams that have just gone to local local rugby clubs to play. I think I've recognised a few faces, but I think none of the lads continued or continued on at pubs. Yeah, no, I mean that is a weird age, and it like you said, the drink, the women, that all yeah. starts to uh, to come in and, and distract everyone from rugby. Um, with that, with that set of cults, did you manage to get on a tour? With them? I didn't. I, we didn't tour those two years. Oh, I suppose yeah. So, so Josh would have missed the under thirteens, under fifteens tours. Yeah, I would have uh, missed all of them. Oh no, that's a whole bit of content we've just missed out. Fuck <laughs> <laughs> me! Why did you make that decision, Josh? <laughs> um, well, I mean, the guys travelled probably some slightly more luxurious places with tennis than, than he would have with rugby. I can't see, you know, Pavia's heading out to uh, Turkey or Egypt on a on a rugby tour. So is there any any stories from your time in tennis, Josh, that, um, you know, where you've thrown a tennis racket out of a hotel window or something slightly more fun? <laughs> you got to think, back then it was I'm probably more of a, I don't know if I should say it, probably more of a complete professional back then when I was 40. <laughs> And um, what I mean by that is, I mean, it was just, I mean, especially now when I'm, if I'm working and stuff, but um, it literally was, if you, if you want to say a full-time sport, that was it. Even at that age, there was there was nothing else. And I mean, I wish I could tell you an embarrassing story or something I did when I was 14, 15, but there was, um, I don't even think I'd even probably had a drink by then because it was so that heavily invested. It all. 
I've made it for it, but yeah, you have. You have made it for it. <laughs> so, I mean, you you've been on some rugby tour, so so where have you I've been? Never been on a tour abroad, other than with not so Jersey or oh, where's we went to Munster. Munster was good. Any stories from Munster? Um. <laughs> <laughs> How have you found such a squeaky clean guest, Phil? We <laughs> never get squeaky clean fucking guests on here. <laughs> Not really too bad, to be fair. I mean, we're because again, you got to think again. That's probably the tour to Munster is when we're out, and our coach was Ian Costello at the time. Who was a Munster was ex Munster coach, and the coaches uh, he was that first time back in Ireland. I think for a while, so he came out with us. We obviously managed to separate ourselves, but um, again... I mean, also, Nottingham had got previous in Munster, so didn't really <laughs> want to There's nothing... harness that anymore. <laughs> no, but we didn't... I can't remember, I don't think anyone got up to anything stupid, to be fair. I mean, we did play, try and play a game of... <laughs> and again, this is probably throwing myself and a few others under the bus, but we, um, we were in a very nice hotel. And they had like, um, can you imagine those Christmas baubles you put on the trees? And from this, this hotel kind of went diagonally up, well, as a square, we went straight up to all, I think, 14 floors, but it was just in a, almost a round, almost like a prison, but it was a very, very nice prison that went straight up and from the ceiling hung these huge balls. And the first thing the receptionist said when we went back out was just, it's been done before, just don't swing the balls because they come right to the balcony. And because obviously you think about it at the time, that would be a stupid idea. Then we've come back and a few of us have thought it would be a good idea to try and grab one, which we did. And then I think one of the lads, I'm not going to say his name, pushed it and I've had to theoretically theoretically jump in front of it to it not smash the entire glass in front of our apartment window and send us... We we had two security guards run up and we had to pretend to be asleep with the lights off, as you do. But that was about about as stupid as it gets. But yeah. (laughs) <laughs> that sounds like more of a, a naughty schoolboy technique. Turn around. <laughs> <up the fingers. laughs> Why well, we did it either? Because we left the door open waiting for someone to come in. So we, we, he probably saw us switch off the lights and go to bed, but... <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to say. Easier, easier just not to comment, innit? Yeah. Um, so let's get some... Before we move on to some other stuff, we have had some questions come in from uh, some people that know you. This is where it's, you, you've been... It's been squeaky bum time for you since you thought about this bit. Because uh, I know you were a bit worried earlier. You said some people are throwing you under the bus. Uh, I don't think they're too bad, if I'm honest. But, I mean, I'm not the <laughs> I'm not the one that's have to, having to answer them. First, uh, are, your sh- are your shorts and socks surgically attached? That was one question that came in. What do they mean by that? I think it just probably means you wear tight shorts, if I'm honest. <laughs> Again, that might come back to me doing a lot of leg sessions and having quite large legs, so that might be it. All those <laughs> small boy shorts. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, under 14 pub shorts. Probably with <laughs> Still repping your uh, Lacoste tennis shorts. <laughs> <laughs> um, one question came from Arv Kendrick. Uh, he says, How do you put up with your dad? I knew there'd be one about the old man. Uh, um, you you don't put up with him you just agree you smile you wave and you hope he doesn't talk for too long oh there's nothing wrong with your dad all he Um, does is is, is, he cares about you so much (laughs) he cares about you so much he's a great bloke he's just incredibly proud of you Um, which is a bit deep because I I think you're a knob but um, (laughs) (laughs) no uh, Josh's dad is, he's brilliant. And I've got a lot of time for him and spent a lot of time with Josh's dad when I was coaching Josh. You know, Josh is right, he he does talk. Um, But uh, no, he's great fun, great fun, great bloke. No, no, I think Arv's just alliterating to the fact that he always gives off stick. So I've got back off. I mean, most people give off stick. I was going to say, we get a message from Arv about that every week, to be fair. Please, someone talk to me. Um, <laughs> this one uh, comes from uh, a lad. I only assume you can, well, you clearly do coach him. Who is your favourite player to coach 
And why is it Dylan? <laughs> it's certainly not Dylan. I mean, I'm um, as you can tell by the comments, I coach a few private school boys who um, who haven't come down to earth slightly yet. I think that it's, it's life's all about them, especially Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, no, it's not Dylan. Do you enjoy coaching? No, I love it. Yeah, yeah, I do actually. I mean, the most to be fair, the most rewarding bit was the was the Colts. I mean, the men's is is there, but I think Corsairs. It's not similar to Pavs in a way where you've got the infrastructure, and you've got the players already. Do you know I mean people that have been there and the lads that are coming up? Because Corsairs is hasn't had a men's team really that the Colts could look up to and play for. Mm. They've kind of been West Bridgeford or they get scattered around as soon as they come to the 18, 19 age group, they kind of then disappear. But yeah, I kind of with the with the men's it's it's it is really good and it's good to to coach those boys and then there's quite we've got the numbers up the last two years which is which is really pleasing but with the Colts I kind of I think I came in with I think there's about five or six of them in training they kind of dwindled off and then by the end of it we were I think they'd, they'd been knocked out the NLD Cup early that's why no one was really interested but by the end of it we had mid-20 lads in sessions actually enjoying it again so that was it's rewarding it is rewarding and it's, it's, it's good to see those boys that we've managed to keep a few with obviously the help from a guy called, I don't know if you boys know, but Rich Whitaker and, and Doug who kind of put a bit of money in towards the club. They've helped with getting boys back from uni and do you know what I mean? To actually, so that people don't just disappear and then don't come back even though they spend kind of 11, 12 years of the club just so they can invest a bit into the men's team. So yeah, I've, I've enjoyed the coaching and it's moving up. Of course, yeah, they're doing much better. Yeah. yeah, it's good. I mean, it was a shame. So my one of my closest friends, he he captained Corsairs for a good five years, I would have thought. Um, and then he moved on purely because he wanted to play, test himself at a slightly higher level. Um, and then they obviously folded for one or two years, I think it was. Yeah. And then they've had to start again now from the bottom. And it is difficult to, you know, to, to move up once you put yourself in that position. But, you know, as another Nottinghamshire club, it's good to see you know, a club coming back, if you like, and, and it working out for them. I mean, they've got enough kids there on a Sunday morning that you'd hope you'd find a couple of gems that you can hold on to, to be honest. Well, that's it, isn't it? It's, it's getting... Because obviously after they disbanded, it's it's tough then trying to reckon, like reconstruct a men's team when you've disbanded and for those two, three years that you've gone, those men that are either with you or people that would have probably been coming up, they've gone. So it's hard to kind of bring people back, isn't it? Because if they're playing at a level and they're kind of, they're in, they've got friends at a different club, it's hard to say that, oh, we're back now, do you want to come back? Then it's like, well, probably not, which you can understand. So you've got to kind of start from scratch, which, yeah, they've done really well. I think I came in, I think Ben Morris, the lad who signed at, um, at Wasps from Knotts, mm -hmm. he was, I think he was there with that first or second year that they restarted. So he, he did a class job and then just kind of kicked off from there. So it's, it's just getting that men's side that's got enough people at training, enough people at game day, so you're ticking all the boxes, you're improving. So then when you get the Colts involved, they go, oh, there's there's a decent men's team, the mm. coaching setup's good, I'm going to stick around, I'm going to get involved. It's just giving them something to, to want to stick around for, I suppose. Yeah, no, definitely. It's all about enjoying it. And I guess when you're at that kind of, that lower level, the, the, the level I play at, you can, uh, you can actually enjoy it a bit more than potentially if it was going straight into a, a higher team because you've got to think a bit more about the rugby as opposed to getting a group of lads back together and actually enjoying playing with each other and forming a, a good little community. So that's cool. Um, so, last question. Uh, where does the nickname The Beast come from? <laughs> you can guess who that comes in from if you want. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Who, who, said the, who asked the question? Uh, well, I've only got his handle here, and I do know his name. But it's just slipped my mind. DC Williams. Yeah, cheese, David. Um, he's gone <laughs> to now from Knotts. Yeah, he's doing really well. Um, well, it was again coming back to the old man. He, um, I think he might have had a few at a Trent game um, when we used to when we played. Well, Trent now played at the Bay, but when we used to play next to the football pitch at university, hmm. I think I'd done something like run over someone or scored a try. And he went <laughs> something like, I can't remember what the words were, but then it finished off with you beast or something. So all the boys <laughs> afterwards <laughs> saying like, well, you can tell what they're saying, but um, 
yeah, it kind of stuck there. Well, it didn't stick because no one uses it other than the few uni boys, but they <laughs> made sure last year that quite a lot of the Knots boys would say it when I was on the pitch. <laughs> uh, we had uh, Phil's sister on Fran, who was the captain of the Trent ladies. Um, she didn't really delve too much into the stories at, at Trent and how much, well, she said how much she enjoyed it, but it wasn't too much going on. But what was it, what do you feel like with, with the Trent lads? Because I know that, I think we went to uni at a similar time and I knew of you and I think I probably hadn't met you at all. Um, did you enjoy your time playing with Trent, the, the games you managed yeah. to? That was, that was probably, if you think of it, when you said when you're playing a lower level in terms of, let's say you're at Pavs and it's third team instead of the first team, you've got to think a little bit, a little bit less about the rugby. You're obviously 100% got to focus on the rugby because it's a very high level of uni rugby and it is still a very high level rugby. In, in the broad spectrum of things, it's a high level rugby. But it's just fucking, it's a good time as well. And it's a good <laughs> laugh. And you're, with, you're with lads and you in, kind of, especially now, it's a bit less drinking on the coach back. Whereas then it was just being freshers in second years and third years, just any away trip, finding any excuse to do any stupid game to get steaming before you have before you get back off the bus and then get in your speedos and do something even more stupid with port and then go to ocean. It was just a good crack and then Thursday you'd have off or we'd train with knots and then Friday you'd, you'd just be straight back on it again. I mean, it, it was it was a hell of a good time and I was, yeah, proud of the achievements as well like with throw University of Nottingham under the bus. I don't think we'd won any varsities or we'd won one in the past in four years and then we went on to win four in a row. So that was always good to stick it to him. I didn't lose a varsity, so that was even more enjoyable of my time being there. Yeah, no, I remember watching most of the varsities while I was at uni and it was nice to be drunk and see you boys beat them. So <laughs> it must have been even better play. Um That was all the questions from the public. I think that, I don't think you got any fill. But... <laughs> So, obviously, you're at Nottingham now. Um, to ask what that looks like at the minute, we'll, we'll probably move on to it, but you're doing other bits as well. So, you're coaching, you're playing. What else are you doing? Um, well, I suppose the easiest one is the, the bit I'm doing. So, obviously, we got furloughed. So, obviously, we're full-time players. And then before, we got, we'll prob- might get on to funding cuts and stuff, but we got, obviously, furloughed because of the pandemic and then in the first lockdown just kind of found myself doing absolutely bugger all I mean I remember <laughs> me Meg coming downstairs from working and I've, I've got that board of cod I've downloaded a f- carp fishing game <laughs> I was just <laughs> I was like what the fuck am I doing and then Meg's looking at me like what are you fucking doing and I'm like I don't know I mean like, there's only so many times the dog can be walked she's like every time I put the lead on her she's biting it off I'm like, I don't really know what else to do. So I um, decided to, well, Meg kind of pushed me. She was like, I don't want you around the house all the time. And I was like, yeah, fine, get a job. So um, <laughs> Kerry's Fresh, which some people might know, is like a bespoke um, kind of groceries, kind of fruit and veg website where you kind of order all your bits. I mean, they've expanded a bit now to like meat and stuff, but um, just packing the boxes, sorting everything out in the morning, all deliveries, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, that was just to top up the furlough. And then, during that, Greg Hill approached me, who's played at Pavs, mm. a bloke, great bloke, and he um, played everywhere, really, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, he offered me a role as like a well, as a trainee financial advisor. So like, kind of just to get my exams done. So he's given me a little space in the office, and he's kind of mentoring me through that. So um, so yeah, a trainee FA, and then Kerry's full-time rugby and coaching when it comes back so I'm pretty busy <laughs> it sounds pretty busy is Kerry's the same Kerry's which was the, the veg stand by uni yeah yeah okay. so they've yeah so during the pandemic there I think they either it was just before or during they I think it might have been just before actually they went to do local deliveries and now I think they're like nationwide and stuff. So they've gone even bigger and bigger as you can imagine that sort of business would thrive at the moment so so um Phil would you like to uh, get your package out? Yes. <laughs> so 
So it's just a quick fire question round, Josh. And to be fair, yours are pretty um yours are pretty tame. Uh mm. mainly because I don't want to get you in trouble. <laughs> um from from dad or from Nottingham. Right. Red or green? Red. Favourite beverage? Lager. Narrow it down. Peroni. Ooh. Ooh. Sorry. Uh, Tim or Andy? What's that again? Tim or Andy? Tim. Text reference. Uh, last time you wet yourself? <laughs> Christ. Um, Please say this point. When I was pissed and 19 years old. Oh, oh yeah. absolute lie. You're not trying hard enough. <laughs> um, Favourite rugby position? Eight. Best player you have played with or against? Ooh. With or against? Tom Croft. Against. Uh, Everard or Cobden? <laughs> Bit of... What What about it? Player? Bloke? Just who do you like more? <laughs> <laughs> um... Both great blokes. I'll go Evs. Uh, Favourite opposition? Oh, to play against. Um, Uni of Nottingham. Safe, yes. I like that. <laughs> and uh, John T or Jim? John T. Okay, we'll go Jim. Yes, yeah, good option. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Doesn't even know who Jim is. Just, just knows he doesn't like John T. Yeah, no fair. <laughs> Bill. Do you want to do worst or favourite? Uh, I'll go favourite this week. So, Josh, what is your favourite rugby memory? Ooh, um, first varsity win as captain. Or, <laughs> a bit oh. broader, probably, no, no, as in, no, nah, probably captain knots and then beating Richmond for my first time I captain knots and the B&I. Two good memories. Talk us through... Why it was the best? Um, varsity won just because it's varsity and fair play. <laughs> feel like big bollocks, don't you? At the time, but um, <laughs> Richmond was the the captain inside of it. Was just good because obviously you know how much the old man's invested, and it was just good to have. Um, obviously, to captain not so, uh, someone. When you say I did have a rugby idol, no. But when I first got back to rugby, I'd go and watch Knots with Dad, and that was a team that. At the time when I wasn't thinking about professional rugby, you'd watch them and you'd be like, oh, this is an incredible standard. And then you obviously get to play it and you're enjoying it. And then you never really think at that age you're getting a chance. And then I started having a good season. And then, um, yeah, I got given the opportunity and that was great. And then I think Dad was 10 times as excited as me for the game. But yeah, it, it was it was lovely and it was nice after the game just to obviously be able to stand in the marquee, everyone asking you about everything. It, yeah, it was that was probably one of my favourite memories. So, yeah, fair play. Uh, what's your worst rugby memory then? <sighs> worst? Um, probably. <laughs> um, do you know, I was playing at Leicester Lions and it was when Bucko was coaching. Oh, well, there you go. Don't have to say any more, mate. That's no fine. more. Fine. Um... <laughs> <laughs> it was when um, Bucko was coaching and we'd, um, we used to do contacts in the warm up and uh, we've gone over to. I can't remember where we were playing. I've been mean, Sheffield way or a little bit further up north. And we'd had no back row subs. We had no second row subs. And I've made a tackle in the warm up and felt something click in my hand like crack. And I've gone up to the physio and I've gone, it's swelled up. And she's been like, oh, look, you have to play. Don't worry about it. I think you've just probably had like a stud on it. When I know I didn't get stamped on, I knew it was probably broke. I was like, I'm probably not going to be able to play. And Buck, I was like, I'll just man up. I was like, yes, I am. I'll get on with it. And at half time, I came in when she'd strapped it and she'd like done a village job of going round, like almost like you'd have your thumb tape. And it was the middle of my hand and she looked at it and the tape was like three inches below where my hand was. I was like, I think I'm probably done. And I was, I've was, i never had pain almost like it. I was like, I've got to come off. And Buck, I was like, no, you're staying home. I've got no subs. Can't put us at number nine at seven, can we? And I was like, no, I'll carry on. I think I had like three fractures in my hand. I had to play 80 minutes, which was um, a pretty dire 80 minutes, especially up north in shitty weather in National 2 with three, three or well, two or three fractures, I think it was in the end. 
I played against Booker that year. I got loaned, had a, a small disagreement with the coach of Doncaster and got loaned out for a week to play for <laughs> Hull FC or Hull Rugby. Yeah. And uh, just happened to be Leicester Lions. And Nixon was playing and Ollie was playing. Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah, scored two, which was uh, quite nice. One of which, one of which was a grubber that I ran onto. Thank you very much. <laughs> just thought you'd chill that in there, did you? Yeah, well, if Bucko's listening, I'm sure he'll love that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just before we let you go, mate, uh, we we tend to try and get a little bit more rugby at the end. Um, obviously, I think it was only yesterday, the day before the the championship fixtures got released um, for the new season. Obviously, there was the split. Now there's not the split. Are you looking forward to getting back to playing? Yeah, I am. Regardless of all the funding stuff and all of what's happened in terms of part-time, full-time, it, it honestly will just be f- good to just play a bit of rugby. Just to get back out there, even if it's with... I mean, this is probably the first time in, gosh, as long as I've been at Knotts, that it's been almost like a complete change of team. I think there's not a complete change, but the environment is just as good but it's like I think there's probably six, seven lads that were from last year if you don't include the uni boys so a complete new set of like, set of lads so that'll be enjoyable because obviously we haven't had the luxury of being able to test from the start so you, we've been in different groups if that makes sense we've only just started to train full time mm. in terms of, like as a, on, a, on a pitch 70 minutes with all 30 or 25, 30 lads so it'd be good just to be able to get out there and experience a bit of rugby with some of the new lads as well and get to know them what what is the feeling in camp at the minute? Then? All positive. Well, I mean, it, no. On the rugby side, it's obviously completely positive. Obviously, some of the lads that I know from last year, it's obviously a bit of a. You've gone from playing professional rugby to then having to work. So it's obviously the the balance and coming in and it being snowing and at nine o'clock at night and you're on the pitch. <laughs> you're fuck. But it's something you got to deal with. It's it's a change, isn't it? I suppose it's 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 positive in camp. A bit we. You only can be positive, can't you? Because we haven't done any pre-season, we haven't done anything, so we haven't even been tested. So it's just training, and we're all the best team in the world when we train, aren't we? So we'll we'll, uh, we'll see what happens. Who's, your, who's the first fixture? Um, Ealing at home, I think. Oh, nice. Yeah, they've, been, they've looked pretty awful in the last two games they've played. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. A dead easy one to start off with. So, <laughs> so you asked me that. You asked me the mood in the camp. Then. Five weeks time. Oh, it'll be <laughs> we'll be way up there. We'll, yeah, we'll be, you'll be flying. You'll be fine. You'll be fine. <laughs> well, you might even get any preseason games then. Are you straight in? I don't, we we won't be able to obviously because of all the testing stuff. But you couldn't even like you couldn't even organise something with Donny beforehand. No, because it'd have to be. So I think Donny had been testing. So they've done that Ealing Trail Finders Cup. Mm. I'm assuming that's all. I mean, I'm not obviously privy to it all, but I'm assuming that's because they can test. Because obviously Nottingham can't do the tests. Do you know what I mean? So they have to have people come in. It'll all be regulated. So you can imagine the admin are behind it. I can't imagine that if if they're going to struggle anyway with funds and this ridiculous loan that they're putting out there, that they're going to then go, oh yeah, let's do an extra day's testing just for the game. Yeah, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. But if you're get, are you getting tested weekly at the moment then? Have you just started your testing now? So, just started my first test was what we're choosing now yesterday so we've just gone back to um stage two is it or maybe stage three i don't know which class does now that we're doing testing but we've just gone into that next stage so we're testing now on mondays which then obviously we get a i should get my test results back tonight to know if i've obviously positive or negative if i'm negative i can go on and train for the week if i'm positive then i have to the club get notified and they have to look at the footage see i've been around so it's a massive ball ache but i know yeah mate it's, it's mental on their side i can't imagine how stressful it's going to be for those the coaches and stuff but then when we get into games obviously we'll have a monday test which means that we can then train for the week if we were negative and then we have a wednesday test and if we're negative for that we can play I mean that is that is mad, isn't it? So you can only imagine what, like we were saying before, it's all right for the the boys that are like kind of full time, almost not working. They they train in their bubble, go home, and then they kind of know that if they've got a negative test, that they're going to be fine for the rest of the week. So they they don't have to worry about the other boys that are there around and stuff like that. Whereas you got to think, let's say there's thirty two lads turn up, 
there's four coaches, there's two analysts or an analyst, or yeah, there's two up there. Then you've got the physio, you've got two S and C interns, you've got the gym guy. They're all at the uni, different households. They're at you, some of them at uni households, which probably people are going home and stuff. You then work in. So 30 different lads in different work environments. You can imagine that you get a negative test on a Monday. Imagine what the things are going to happen during the week. So I don't really know. That's going to be the issue, I think. But hopefully that all kind of goes as smooth as possible and, and lads kind of understand that it'd be nice to get things going. So don't go inviting 30 lads around at uni. So if anyone's listening at uni, don't be a dickhead. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I know it's easy to be a dickhead. <laughs> dickhead. Um, um, if I was you in your position at uni, probably might have been a dickhead, but don't be a dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably not the best examples. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, just final question. First of May, at home to, to Saris, I mean, there might even be allowed people in to come and to watch at that point. Is that something that you've spoken about with the lads at all, looking that far ahead to May, or, or not really? Not, not the minute. I mean... At the minute, it's literally just been, again, because of the testing stuff and because of how you can't be that close to people. I mean, it's a long story short. You literally don't speak to, don't get much time to speak to anyone. You're kind of in your gym. You can talk during the gym, I suppose, and during the pitch, but then it's just kind of focusing on the gym or focusing on what you're doing on training because you can't hang around afterwards. That makes sense because you guys, you guys will know half the stuff you talk when you're having like chat and stuff will be in the changing room after or before when you just sat down talking about stuff. So, I mean, there hasn't been too much. I mean, obviously, you all have a laugh and a giggle. And you say, we do, can't wait to do Sarah's at home on the, <laughs> whatever the day is. <laughs> but, I mean, we all know the challenge that <laughs> you're going to face. So, you just smiles on faces, enjoy it, and then do the best you can when you come up against them. What do you reckon the odds are that you'll be playing against some internationals? Well, have you seen that? I think, wasn't the rumour that there's one international, you get one bye week because Scottish aren't involved. And the bye week just so happens to be for Saracens when the international game's on. Oh, funny that, isn't it? Oh, <laughs> so interesting. What a coincidence that is. I mean, that probably is. I mean, if there's anyone out there, it probably is, um, or a few, a massive coincidence and nothing to, to, to benefit them. Not that I don't think they probably fucking need Billy and Mako They're playing 80 minutes for them all the time. But, I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's, but, uh, I mean... It depends because when you listen to those boys in those interviews, they say that that like, Mako has been interviewed, doesn't he? And stuff. He's so they're saying that yes, they've been told that they'll be limited in terms of what games they play. I think they get probably told, but um, there's every chance you could come up on one of those weeks when six or seven boys are involved. Yeah, but, I mean it'll be interesting, won't it? Because I mean they've not got a small squad. Um, you know, we had Lewington on the other week. Um, obviously they probably got a small squad at Trent at the moment because they're having a bit of a trouble with the uh, with the old pandemic but um, they've got 50 odd players on the books and if you look at the team that played in all fairness to Ealing they look like they played alright on the weekend on the brief amount of the highlights that I could mm. cope on watching earlier um, the the commentator was doing my head in so I'd switch it off um, but um, the the team they put out is not a first team or I've fucking hope for their sake it is not a first team because a lot of those lads were garbage um, no I saw the academy lads in there yeah there was a lot of young lads in there fair enough um, I'm sure one day they'll be excellent rugby players just to come <laughs> back um, but you'd hope that they're going to throw out a couple of you know high profile players every week the The real sadness is is that, you know if this Harris came to Nottingham in a position where not in club fans in, you'd probably get the biggest crowd of the year by far yeah. that night or that Sunday afternoon, wouldn't you? 100%. It'd be like that, uh, that Tonga International, was it? Was it Tonga? When they had the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that, isn't it? It's, it? That attracts those fans that are either on the fence about coming or the fans that some sometimes will, will choose something over that over the weekend. Whereas you think, oh, crikey, Sari's boys are in it's going to cost me a fraction of the price to come down and I get to watch them play. So yeah, it was like, it was like when Saints, when, when Northampton came down and, you know, I was doing sort of water boy for most of that year because I was only 17, 18, but there was like 4,000 people at Madeleine that day just because Carlos Spencer was playing. <laughs> Ashton, and it was like, 
it was amazing. Like the atmosphere was incredible, but it was only because it was Northampton. Like it's not people crawling out of the woodwork to watch Nottingham. No, no. Hopefully by then we'll be able to get some people in because you're right. It would do fucking well to good for the bar takings and 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 for the lads as well. I imagine it must feel a bit weird going back to playing to absolute well, not absolute silence, but must be. Is that at the back of your mind at all? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it, it will feel strange. It'll almost feel like a pre-season, won't it? But obviously, you know, there's... And again, I was about to say, you know, there's something on the line, but there's no relegation, there is promotion. So you're obviously fine for promotion. Well, however realistic that is, you know that you get a few good wins under your belt and you have absolutely no idea what can happen in sport at the end of the day, isn't it? Mm. But, I mean, it's, it is going to feel weird, I suppose. I mean, because even though at Lady Bear, you laugh, there's ne- ne- never like ridiculous amount of fans but because of how where you are and how it's situated it always seems quite loud there's obviously always an environment mm. Mark Marky's always seriously good after a game mm. so obviously that's going to be missed because it's just going to be obviously straight off I'm assuming if fans aren't loud and you're just going to have to be doing that testing procedure where you straight off shower get in your car and you're off home so it is obviously going to be extremely strange but again like I mean <laughs> it's what exactly what Eddie and them not saying for England at the minute, isn't it? But it's just going to be a privilege to be able to play still. During a pandemic, we're able to go out and play some sport. So you got to feel privileged however many minutes you get, or even if it's just training and we don't, and something happens from here till tomorrow, and we get told that we can't play, which is probably quite a big chance if some the figures pick up back up in the, in the news or whatever happens, and we get told it's all canned. You've got to just take each session as the way it is, isn't it? Because you've got to enjoy it because quite a lot of people are stuck at home and probably can't wait to get out there and train. So I can't really moan about not having any fans when I'm training three times a week, enjoying it with the lads and then get to go out on the weekend and play against Surrey. So. I don't know what yeah. you're talking about, Josh. I love being at home every day with my three women in the house and uh, not being able to play rugby or see my friends. I absolutely love it. You get to yeah. see me every week. I do. Well, I see you twice a week, Tom, don't I? Or three yeah. times a week, actually. I mean, so you are a lucky fucking bastard. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> on that note, Josh, thanks for coming on, mate. Yeah, it's been a pleasure to touch you and have a, a, a good season. Thank you very much. Pleasure being on. There we go. That was uh, Josh Pooley. Good podcast. Good. Like I said, very informative. Very honest. Brutally so. <laughs> Um, yeah, he, he's a good lad, and you know, I really enjoyed coaching. And yeah. uh, you know, he, he was a good player for the club when he when he played for those seasons before he before he moved on. Yeah, I mean, in my head, I still can't get round why tennis is bad for your bones, but rugby is, and it, my head's gone. If I'm honest, I uh, I have no idea. I Wikipedia did it, and it didn't help. So no, well, I, I think you go from tennis where you're, they're quite soft. Mm. To rugby, and you just kind of get on with it, don't you? You don't, yeah. Don't I guess back when someone's got their studs going through your calf, yeah. I mean, he can't really be that much of a tennis genius because he didn't quite gather the they didn't understand the Tim or Andy question, did he? Yeah, but to be fair, <laughs> Tim was probably retired by the time he started playing. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, coming too, coming too. I think I, I think that's more of him not being a genius than a tennis genius. <laughs> yeah, this might be. Uh, I'll let you chat to him about that one. Um, <laughs> yesterday, Nathan, before you, we have a quiz for people then on a Thursday sometimes. But uh, Nathan did say that um, he kind of moulded Josh into to what he is, um, oh. not you. So, and when I said you took credit. He said, of course. Um, so I, I didn't want a discussion about it. I just thought I'd let people know that... Um, I, wouldn't claim, I wouldn't claim responsibility for Josh, any of Josh's actions on or off the field, Your Honour. To, to be fair, there's many Joshes that have been at Pavs that no one would want to claim any form, <laughs> yeah, of, <laughs> any form of cover over. Right. Um, just some, obviously, a few parish notes this week. There's actually some stuff going on. So... Um, Obviously, we've got the Fantasy League. Still time to join that. Uh, annoyingly, John T is second. Um, but Fan Expert is first. And if you... I'm, I'm not sure I've met you, Fan Expert, so do let us know who you are. Um, 
because you might have a bottle of Cyan Lambrini coming to you in a few weeks' time. Um, cash money. Pardon? Cash money. Cash money. And also, uh, Neil Kendrick, who is our uh, president, is hosting a quiz on the weekend of the 19th to the 21st of February. Just had to get the details in. It's £5 a donation. Uh, there are prizes for the winner. And if you want to know, there are details on our Instagram and Facebook and also probably the club website if you want to get in there. You don't have to be related to Pabs to get involved with the quiz. The more, the merrier. All the money goes to uh, the Century 2022 Project Fund pot thing. Um, but Neil is known around the quiz world as a good quiz master. So oh, he's, he's, the, uh, he's the grand pooper, isn't he? Yeah, he is. He's he is Christina, Christina, thank you, Lara. Anyway, let's not give him nicknames. Um, <laughs> next week uh, it's going to be a good guest. We hope Probably, because yeah. Probably will be, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean it could be a crap guest. Um, we don't know yet because yeah, again we've not organised it, so we'll let you know in the week when we know you'll know. Um, any wise words, Phil? Um, happy birthday to me. I was going to do that after. Oh, sorry. Well, they're pretty... Right. Yeah. Happy take birthday, it. mate. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Have, a good... <laughs> Have a good one. And uh, we probably... We might go live tomorrow. Let's see how uh, many birthday beers you've had. Right. Chat to you in a bit. Bye. Bye.